positive importance of genetic and environmental factors for the development of conduct problems in children who have high callous and emotional traits and in children who have low callous and emotional traits. And I've been uh, fortunate to work with a very big twin registry that is headed by Robert Plomin at the Institute of Psychiatry here in London. And able to do, because this was a very large twin sample, is to select those children who are in the top 10% for conduct problems for the twin sample. So they are scoring in an atypical range for conduct problem. And then we divided this extreme group to two. We took those children where either one or two members of the twin pair also scored in the top 10% for callous and emotional traits. And then we looked at children where neither member of the twin pair scored in the top range for callous and emotional traits. And within each of these groups, we were able to compare the identical and non-identical twins to give us an indication of how heritable are the conduct problems for children who have callous and emotional traits and how heritable are conduct problems for children who have low levels of callous and emotional traits. And what we found was that for children who had high callous and emotional traits, the conduct problems were strongly heritable. Whereas for children who had low levels of callous and emotional traits, environmental influences, both shared and non-shared, were more important for the development of conduct problems. Now that doesn't mean that the children who have high callous and emotional traits are somehow genetically destined to become antisocial. Um, but it does mean that they probably have more of a vulnerability, innate vulnerability for developing conduct problems. Similarly, it doesn't mean that the children who have low levels of callous and emotional traits have no genetic risk whatsoever, but it may be that that, that takes different form and may require some environmental factors uh, to express, or more environmental factors that you may need uh, to express this vulnerability um, if you have high callous and emotional traits. Of course, the twin studies only give us an idea of the relative importance of genetic and environmental factors, and they don't tell us what the actual genes are or the actual environments. And currently, there is very scarce data about the actual genes and actual environments, particularly for children with high callous and emotional traits. So ourselves and uh, other people have speculated that the risk genes for high uh, callous and emotional traits and low callous and emotional traits type antisocial behavior may be different. And this would be in line with the fact that the other group is associated with low emotional reactivity, whereas the other one is associated with high emotional reactivity. So in a way, you would expect there to be different vulnerability genes for the two groups. Perhaps uh, genes that confer low emotional reactivity and arousal in the case of children with high callous and emotional traits. And there's certainly some data to support that this may be the case. Um, so a, a genotype called serotonin transport of molymorphism has been associated with um, uh, callous and emotional traits. And the allele, or the, the type of that genotype that was associated, was the one that confers lower emotional reactivity. We know that from um, imaging genetic studies. But this is just a single study. Interestingly, this genotype only conferred risk in children who lived in low resource neighborhoods. So it suggests that you may have propensity to lack emotional reactivity or lack empathy, but whether that expresses itself as callous and emotional traits or not may depend on your environmental conditions. There are also some uh, studies that have uh, suggested that genes that may be associated with uh, attachment processes could be important, such as the oxytocin receptor gene, but ultimately, there haven't really been replications of these findings. We have ourselves condu conducted a genome-wide association study, which means that we combed through the whole genome, looking whether there is anything that crops up, and there really weren't any big hits. Um, and there hasn't been a uh, robust replication of either our study or any of the other studies. So it's very early days, but if this particular phenotype goes in line with what we know from other behavioral phenotypes, and I have no reason to expect that it would be different, we're likely uh, to be spending a long time looking for those genes. They are going to be small genes that probably, sorry, genes of small effect size that probabilistically increase the risk for developing this sort of behavioral outcome. And it is more than likely that any of these genotypes will require the presence of other risk genes and environmental risk factors um, in order to penetrate as a risk um, phenotype. 
again, our cells and others have proposed that for those with low callus and emotional traits, we might be interested in looking for genes that confer high arousal and reactive aggression. And again, there's some, there's some tentative data suggesting that these sorts of gene types may be associated with the uh, low callus and emotional type of antisocial behavior. And gene environment interaction may be particularly uh, important uh, with regard uh, to this subtype. So there are a number of good studies suggesting that if you have a polymorphism of monoamine oxidase uh, A gene that confers increased emotional reactivity, and if on top of that you experience maltreatment, then you are at a substantially increased risk for developing conduct problems. But very, very early days, and all of these studies need more replications, and we probably need to really wait for a lot of methodological developments before we can reliably start finding uh, genes associated with this condition. Similarly, the risk environments may differ for the two conditions. So we have reasonably good data for the low callous unemotional traits subgroup. Uh, it's reliably associated with harsh and inconsistent parenting and maltreatment, but we have less of an idea of what are environmental risk factors that promote development of callous and emotional traits. And our own work using uh, identical twin differences design where we rely on the fact that these are each other's clones and any differences in phenotype in response to uh, uh, environmental factors such as parenting um, should be um, kind of we can reliably say that that's environmental using that sort of methodology we haven't been able to show that harsh and inconsistent parenting for instance predicts increase in callous and emotional traits so that doesn't seem to be uh, something that impacts um, development of those traits, or at least not as reliably as it does for the children who have low callus and emotional traits. There's some very interesting early data. This is a funny looking graph with lots of little data points, but I will talk you through it. Um, Paul Frick and his colleagues looked at the relationship between harsh and inconsistent parenting and conduct problems. And when you look at children who have conduct problems and low callus and emotional traits, you can see this dose-response relationship. The higher the frequency of high and inconsistent parenting, uh, the higher the level of conduct problems for these children. But in contrast, children who have conduct problems and low levels of callus and emotional traits appear to have high levels of conduct problems, regardless of whether they receive less or more of the harsh and inconsistent parenting. Now, this is not to say that environmental influences don't matter for these children at all. And in fact, there is some very uh, interesting new work showing that, for instance, parental warmth is associated with lower levels of callous and emotional traits. So these children may be responsive to some positive environmental influences. Uh, there have also been treatment studies that have shown that some parent-focused, parenting-focused interventions can be effective in reducing callous and emotional traits and conduct problems. And there is a recent uh, uh, study showing that if you add empathy training to normal parent training programs, children who have high levels of conduct, uh, callous and emotional traits may particularly benefit from this sort of training, at least when it's done uh, with children who are at the preschool, early primary school age range. So, some evidence that there are protective environmental factors that can be very helpful for these children. So, why do some people become psychopaths? I'm afraid um, that we have only taken baby steps so far in terms of research. So we have some inclination, but we really don't have a good idea of uh, the developmental trajectory, uh, particularly at different levels of analysis. So there's indication that these children may be more genetically vulnerable, but I hasten to add, not genetically destined for this sort of outcome. Um, it may be that they lack environmental buffers or they have some risk environmental factors which we yet don't know what they are that mean that the genetic vulnerability expresses itself as callous and emotional traits. And we know that they... Um, are not very emotionally reactive, uh, empathetic, they're insensitive to punishment, and this sort of presentation at the cognitive emotional level is probably going to make them more resistant to typical socialization uh, efforts. But we also know from longitudinal studies that not all children who have 
conduct problems and high callous and emotional traits grow up to be adults with psychopathy. So we really do need more longitudinal studies that combine different methodologies and will um, enable us to really study what are the environmental risk factors, how may they be different at different time points, how do they influence uh, development of these children's cognitions um, and um, affect processing. So how does the atypical emotionality develop over time? Um, it's interesting to find out, and this is something that we are, we are studying at the moment in our group, is whether these children can empathize under any circumstances. So if we focus their attention differently, or if we use stimuli that they themselves report as, say, sadness or fear-inducing, do we then see an emotional response? And if we do, can that be harnessed to teach them a bit more about how to empathize with other people? So can we help to see them to see the world differently? I think that's a kind of an important research question for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, I know that there are specific interventions being developed that really focus on the difficulties that these children um, experience. And I'm sure that there will be a lot of crosstalk between these interventions and the basic science research. So some of our basic science findings will feed into how these interventions are tailored more specifically to meet the needs of these children. And of course, there is the hope that eventually there will be very few of the individuals who develop psychopathy as an adult outcome. And I want to finish by uh, very much acknowledging all the people who are working in our team at the moment and who've worked in our team in the past. This sort of research requires a lot of theoretical knowledge, technical skills, statistical skills, and uh, first and foremost, a lot of people skills in uh, in when we recruit the samples or when we um, test the children. And we have a, a very capable team of uh, people um, who um, are involved in the research. And I particularly want to acknowledge Amy McCrory, who's there at the center with me, who co-directs the um, uh, research group with me. And also want to acknowledge the people who have very generously funded our research. And I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you. And I should also mention that you can go to our lab's website and there will be information about our research and materials in that website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Anybody has a good question? It has to be the very best question that can be asked. Um, if a high... Um, callous and emotional traits are genetic. That would suggest that maybe one or both of the parents also share some of those traits. Yep. So could that be an environmental factor leading to yep. uh, so that's problems? An, so that's an excellent question. So the question was that if these traits uh, are heritable and one or two of the parents share the traits, does that mean that the child is uh, more likely to be um, exposed to environmental risk? In short, uh, yes, it's a phenomenon that we call gene environment correlation, which is that the parents parent according to that uh, genotype that they pass on to their children. So the child kind of has the double whammy of having genetic vulnerability and then perhaps, perhaps having a parent who is not really able to provide the optimal parenting environment um, either. There is some interesting data suggesting that that may not always be the case. So there's data from a colleague of mine in Australia, Mark Dad, that has looked at how the children and the parents engage with each other. And interestingly, at least in the case of the mothers, the mothers of these children try and look for eye contact, try and engage the children just in the same way as any typical mothers do. But the children themselves don't engage in the same way. So they don't look the mothers in the eyes. They don't kind of... Um, give back in the same way. So whilst I'm, I'm sure that you're right that there are a number of times where the environment is also impoverished because of the parents' vulnerability, it's not always the case. And sometimes these kind of attachment difficulties may be driven by the child and the very difficult temperament that the child has. 